welcome to another episode of Video Game Logic. Today's episode was recorded on August the 6th, 2018. I'm your host, gaming psychologist, and with me, as always, the amazing, the astonishing, the caffeine rage. On today's show, we will be discussing the July Game Club, which is Final Fantasy Tactics. We will remind you what the next upcoming Game Club is. E3 accidentally leaks personal details of journalists, YouTubers, and analysts. Bethesda missteps the Doom re-release. Google testing its Play Pass subscription for Android. We will briefly take a stroll down the community corner, and we will have a Steam Discovery queue. Timestamps will be in the show notes following their respective topics. Hello, my friend. Hello. That's you. Uh, and I said hello. Oh, it cut out for a second then. <laughs> Yay. Uh. We're off to an amazing start. <laughs> uh, at this rate, we may as well be published by Bethesda. Yeah, I even prepared a whole list of things. Like that's I, that's why I had amazing and astonishing. I'm I'm stealing a trick from a another podcast I like and how they do introductions. And I've got a whole list of things that we're gonna go through so that I'm no longer just pulling them out of my ass like two seconds before we start the recording. Oh, don't worry. I'm sure they'll still stink just as much. But I'm. Just... Oh yes. come on, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today, sir? Uh, I'm doing all right. Uh, glad I don't have to mess with the PlayStation emulator anymore because that's been fighting me tooth and nail the last couple of weeks. But that's yeah. Game Club uh, content. We will get to that very shortly. I'm doing pretty good, too. A little tired, but that's not really any different from any Tuesday night. On the rare occasion, I'm like where I'm awake because it's like a slow day or whatever. I had an average day today. In terms of clients and things, I uh, completely went over someone's head talking about PC stuff today. We were in the the last few minutes, like wrapping up our session, and all trying to get your up. sword. <laughs> no, no, I didn't even see the uh, Matt, the IT guy today. Uh, uh, what his name is the Matt? The <laughs> Matt, the IT guy. No, he's not always in our building because he services several offices in in the area. But just his sort of home base is in the office in Chattanooga. But anyways, um, I was having this chat with a client just wrapping up the session. And he was talking about how uh, he was putting into practice some of the things we had been talking about for, uh, you know, decompressing, having some personal time. And uh, he was saying like, yeah, I... Uh, talk to my brother and we're going to build a gaming PC and I'm going to get back into gaming. I haven't really gamed since I was in college. And like he said, build a PC. So my brain clicked from general gaming to dis- discussion to let's dissect what this machine is. <laughs> and like, I just started asking him questions and he's like, I, I don't know what you're saying. And I was like, well, you said build a PC and that triggered me and he was like oh yeah that's right you told me like you build pcs for fun and you're like a hardcore pc gamer and i'm like yeah and he's like i don't know what the fuck you're saying my brother's the one that that does this stuff and so i was like well shit <laughs> i was looking forward to having another person to talk to about hardcore pc building stuff oh trying to replace me huh trying to add no i don't know it's just always nice to have people to talk about with a hobby that you love and enjoy. And I don't have very many of those people in, like, the m- m- real space, mm-hmm. you know? So, most of the time, I like, I get really excited when I can just talk to somebody about it randomly. But that was my fun experience for today, I guess. Um, before we really get started into the show, we were going to bring this up right at the top. If you live in the United States or in general follow any news related to the United States or gaming news, which I assume you would at least to some extent listening to our podcast, uh, you will know that the U.S., uh, in particular Trump and the Republican Party, is attacking video games again as a source for violence due to a recent couple of uh, another couple of mass shootings in the United States. 
we have dissected this numerous times in the past, both the issue of video games not actually causing violence, and we've actually gone into detail a couple of times about our own personal beliefs about things like gun violence in the United States. We talked about it before the show, and we feel like this is all we really need to say to address it. Address it. It's another tragedy. It's terrible. And, and another diversion tactic. Because yeah, they don't want to talk about the hard issues, because that's you know, some of their base, and also some of their, well, honestly, sponsors. Let's be perfectly yeah. frank here. And no, that's not conspiracy theory whenever you start looking at uh, some of their funding, huh? <laughs> right? Indeed. So, we didn't want to let it completely slide. But at the same time, we don't want to give them the power by allowing it to dominate the narrative of our otherwise, you know, fun, stupid, you know, video game podcast. So, um, you know, if you if you feel the need to personally engage with us about it, you want to ask some more questions, or if you're a newer listener, you haven't hold our, heard our old episodes, uh, feel free to get in touch with us on uh, our Discord server. You can send in an email. You can tweet at us. Um, and if you're really curious, we can go back and find uh, an episode or two where we've discussed it, and we can give those to you. Or, I mean, you can actively chat with us about it. Uh, I pretty much openly welcome any discussion or anything like that. So you can hit us up there if you have any questions or if you want to talk about it more in depth. But, you know, like I just said, I don't feel like giving this any more time or power than what we already have. So we know it and, happened. And honestly, it's really shitty. I was going to say, and honestly, it uh, it's, feels like just pissing in the wind at this point because they just ignore any evidence and just, yeah. I mean, it's not like they do that with any other topics that or have a scientific basis, right? No, never. Oh, wait. No, no, no. You got that wrong. It's the exact <laughs> opposite of that. Yeah, they ignore everything. Yeah, but remember, wow. they're not the party of uh, feels versus reels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, American politics so is just about stupid. A... So let's talk about something less stupid. Let's go talk about another party system. Ooh. Uh, that was Well played. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So oh, that's a rare uh, good one from you. I know. We're skipping games we played this week because I was the only one who had games played, and which is fine. It's happened the other way before, too. We are going to dive straight into Game Club, which, in case this is your first time listening to a Game Club episode, what Game Club is is a way for Rage and I and the listeners to get on the same page, play the same game at the same time, and then have a little chat about it. Uh, typically, Rage and I play both different games, and even when we do play the same or similar games, they happen to be at different times. Uh, and so this allows us to really explore a game from each of our perspectives. And we Typically, also have I, I very different tastes, both in just what we look for in a game and the games we typically like in general. Yeah. Uh, so for July, and I know that this is August, but uh, due to my travels, we skipped recording last week. And that gave us a little extra time to play Final Fantasy Tactics. Not that that helped very much. We will get into that very soon. <laughs> Um, but the game club for July was Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, we played the original, well, air quotes, original PS1 version. Uh, we both emulated it. Anyone who might have played along at home and you had an original PS1 version, awesome. You probably had a better time than us. Yeah, it um, makes me wish I uh, dug out uh, my old version or my old copy because I actually have the greatest hitch copy uh, just buried in a box somewhere and I didn't want to bother digging it out. That was a mistake. Yeah. Final Fantasy Tactics is a game that I think we had both played before. Yeah, I played, I, had, I would say about a quarter of the way through, but I don't remember I think, much of it. Yeah, I think that I beat it previously, uh, but I was a kid and I don't remember. I didn't also didn't remember very much of it. Um, and I honestly, I can't remember if I beat it or not. Like I scrubbed through the story on the wiki. And I was like, ah, I remember parts of this, and I don't remember other parts of it, so who knows. Um, but yeah, we wanted to play a tactics game, or and we wanted to play something that was emulated, and we settled on Final Fantasy Tactics. 
Um, we both had issues with our emulators. Yours, I think, were worse than mine. I only had the one major issue at the very end. Yeah, I had maybe mine just say fuck it. Completely down me at one point, and I had to do a complete reinstall. That was pretty much an evening uh, because by the time I got it up and running again, I was just was not in the mood to play Final Fantasy Tactics. And I also had my save states break. And uh, this is getting more into gameplay, but there's long sections of cutscenes, and then the battles are not short. (laughs) I think that's fair to say, right? Yeah. And what I was doing was I was using the game's save system as essentially a bookmark of where I was at the end of a play session. And then using save states for in between because I didn't want to have to go through a cutscene uh, to get to a battle. And sometimes the cutscenes and battles kind of run together. So, you know, it's a good way to skip a good portion of talky talky or texty texty bits in this case. Yeah. Uh, and I hit a game over due to a difficulty spike. Uh, turns out I didn't grind enough because the game was being too lenient on me on my random battles on the overall map. And I had someone just going around one-shotting everything, which kind of, you know, it's tough to deal with. So when I yeah, went to so load my save state, it didn't load. It was corrupted. Or it uh, just didn't save at all. I'm not sure which. The The emulator doesn't have a or at least uh, I ever saw any visual indication of when it saves a state, so... Mm. Yeah. So my issue uh, was, I got about... I'm not 100% sure how much time I had played. uh, Somewhere between 6 and 8 hours. And um, I went to load it up and play some more, you know, uh, last, last night before we did Community Game Night. And I loaded it up, and it told me that my disc was unreadable. And I went, that's strange. I'm not using a disc. Uh, So I I did, like, a little bit of troubleshooting. Like, tried, like, unmounting and remounting the disc image and a couple other things. And that just never... It it kept saying my disc was unreadable. So I did some troubleshooting. And it looks like that sometimes the game or the emulator for, for certain games will... Uh, as you create saves and things, will change the actual uh, ROM file in some way that I couldn't quite understand. Like, it wasn't being explained very well, but basically they were like, yeah, you either have to get a different ROM or go through and, like, manually find and fix the errors. And I was like, you know what, fuck it. That's way too much work to to get it working. I I played it enough uh, already. So... Um, yeah, and the thing is, in my a- testing, I had none of these issues. I had a few graphical issues on top of things. It's like, you know, yeah, it lulled me into a false sense of uh, security, and it's like, haha, we got him now. I didn't have any issues with graphics or noticeable bugs. I mean, there, you know, there could have been bugs that I didn't realize, like they were so small, or or just yeah, you like wrote that. it off as a uh, game design as well. Yeah, because there's some so- odd things with the menu in this game. Yeah, playing this game is is another exercise in why we oftentimes keep nostalgic things in the past. The game itself is not bad, but it shows that it's over 20 years old. Both in how it plays, the pacing of the game. Lots of Final Fantasy games have pacing issues, and that hasn't really changed even in the modern era. But this one feels especially egregious with the opening, um, you know, battles taking way way too long like i think about other tactic tactics games that i've that i played you know the front mission series uh some ones that were released around the time of like lord of the rings they had some spin-off tactics games and you know just on and on and on and then like pacing like good battle times particularly for the beginning are just a few minutes you know five ten minutes yeah enough to really show you what the game is about yeah but the ones in final fantasy tactics 20, 30 minutes, more. And it's also... battles, depending. And also, a lot of that is sitting around waiting. Uh, you know, enemy units uh, move slowly. And also, at least at the beginning of the game, a good chunk of your own army is not under your direct control, or your own squad, or whatever you want to call it. Because you have guest people that keep joining, 
and those are AI controlled. So you have to wait on those as well. So yeah. when I, uh, towards the end of my time, I had two uh, guest team members. So I was waiting on them and hoped that they don't go do something, you know, foolish. Like uh, on the battle I wiped on, actually, they both went after this one lone guy way off in the corner of the map. Both of them, two of my strongest fighters. <laughs> and I'm left with uh, all the scrubs thinking, wait, wh where are you going? <laughs> Oh, you're going after that archer. Do both of you need to go? <laughs> yes, we do. And also, they all grouped up right uh, in front of a black mage. That's a bad sign. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's the type of mage. It's not a mage who is black. It's a mage who yeah, uh, they have, uh, deals with black magic. Yeah, they have black mage and white mage. This is um, working much more in the classic job, st or cla we would call think of them more as classes, but they call them jobs mm -hmm. in the classic system for Final Fantasy. Yeah, uh, uh, with yeah, the job system is actually it's pretty interesting because it's actually a segregated job system. Mm hmm. Uh, which uh, gets more into just the uh, gameplay game mechanics of it. But did you ever look at the full job tree? I did. It's pretty intense. Actually. Yeah, it's hilarious what the uh, what the penumbra, what the ultimate job is, huh? Yeah, I'm actually going to look at the list, pulling up the list right now on the wiki. It's a mom. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. Don't think I would want. I don't know. I don't know if I'd want a mime. Well, uh, <laughs> I don't know how good they are. Uh, they're able to mimic any other uh, class's abilities, so they're pretty okay, good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, but uh, it's you start off with either squires or chemists, and chemists is like, huh? <laughs> uh, then chemists are uh, basically your mages that uh, go into either white mage or black mage. And then uh, climbs the uh, tree, uh, or essentially web, because there's a, sort of a third version. But it requires building up both of, of the white mage and black mage to become a calculator. Mm -hmm. Which I'm actually not sure what that is in this, and I'm looking for it on the list. Da, da, da. I'm probably butchering the name of it as well. Uh, they can cast most magic for free. And without a charge time, oh. assuming that they already know the spell and can do the right calculations for it. Oh, well, it turns out I wasn't butchering the uh, name of it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it looks like the remake uh, uh, made it, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it sounds like you're not picking up Office Max, huh? Yeah. <laughs> because there was a remake of the game, uh, but also they mucked with it a little bit, changed some uh, of the names... Uh, change some uh, of the uh, just the flow of the game because some of the uh, of the classes require a lot more experience. I'm actually not sure what else they changed. Uh, they added multiplayer oh. in the re release or remake, whatever. Um. I don't. I'm looking for a list of everything. I remember reading that, but I don't see. Yeah, yeah. Part of me uh, thinks maybe we sure should have done the somewhere. remake, but yeah, this seemed a lot more fun going back to the original. Yeah. Um, in terms of let's see, let's talk about in terms of things like graphics. Uh, it doesn't look bad. I mean, it looks like a game from this era. Mm -hmm. But the good thing about a tactic style game where you've got your camera kind of pulled back a little bit. That always helps with these older games yeah. because you're not right up in the face of everything. So some of any sort of graphical issues or low fidelity is hidden just by the distance at which you're playing. I still thought it looked pretty good. Uh, I like the generally colorful palette. Yeah, sort um, of the chibi art style or not quite chibi, yeah. but yeah, uh, a, a deformed art style to it. I, yeah. I would say the Nintendo 64 is probably the toughest uh, console to really go back to. 
uh, just because of uh, overall graphics, uh, not even counting just control issues with that mutant three-handed controller. The the PlayStation era, yes, it has some uh, rough graphics, but uh, it was such a long lifespan that once you get past the initial releases, they uh, are looking pretty decent in Final Fantasy Tactics while an earlier PlayStation release, or PlayStation 1 release, I should say, definitely uh, holds up fairly decently to uh, in the graphics department. Yeah. Um, I like the the music, the the general uh, audio of the game. I I think still holds up very well. Um, yeah, I agree. It's just I, I had to take my headphones off at one point because I couldn't take the loop uh, for that long because battles took forever. Yeah, uh, the soundtrack is is I guess minimal, maybe with like the variants in it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it, you know, it is a, a PlayStation One game. They had a lot less space to work with. In terms of, you know, putting high quality varied audio files in. But I still liked it. I've always liked the soundtrack for pretty much any Final Fantasy game I've ever played. They've always utilized uh, whatever technology is available to them at the time. Um, You know, the older games utilizing various things and like PC speakers and what they could do with like um, MIDI and things like that. Very cool. Uh and every Final Fantasy game, I think, has always had a really beautiful soundtrack or score mm-hmm. once you get into the much newer games. But that, you know, that held up well. General gameplay-wise, it's fine. Um, it's just slow. It's slow, and it's old, and you can see where games have developed since this. There's a lot of stuff, and, and I don't know if, if Tactics specifically invented some of this stuff. I doubt it did. But just thinking about it, like, it utilizes a lot of your sort of standard attacking, flanking from the side or attacking from the rear is better. You've got a sort of rock, paper, scissors thing going on with, they have their zodiac signs in the game. But think like, you know, fire beats water, basically. And, you you know, you can learn that that sort of thing. Um, It's got the movement and then action system that so many other games, you know, utilize in today for, for actual troop movements and stuff. Um... You know, things like that, but... Yeah, it definitely wasn't very... the first. Uh, sorry, I'm looking at the history of uh, tactical RPG now. <laughs> hmm. uh, because I was thinking of things like Tactics Ogre. Ooh, that would be one to go back to. <laughs> I've never played Tactics Ogre. Uh, Think of a strategy RPG meets card game. Interesting. But, you know, it's got all of these elements in it, which, you know, like I... Like I first said like i i didn't think it that they would have been like the first game to do it but they're all the same familiar designs but this is back in the day air quotes or mm-hmm. where that you know there just wasn't as much that was going on and any small changes that made a game even a little bit unique in that in in some way that it played or handled or presented itself were much more important than kind of reinventing the wheels on the mechanics and it, it, to some extent i appreciate that the simplicity of it, how easy it is to just know and pick up if you have experience. But, I mean, it's it's old and it's slow and the menus are a little wonky and clunky and the job system progression can be a little clunky at times. Yeah, especially like, the stuff fact that's not explained go, the best yeah. all the time. I have to go back and forth on certain jobs. Like, uh, well, we talked about the calculator, happy to get both white and black mage, but once you get to some of the more advanced jobs... Uh, they require three of the uh, things, or uh, going to the other side of the tree and going up the healer path, essentially. Yeah, and when you ch- when you level up and get a new job level or a new job class or a new job, wh- however you want to re- you know say that, you get to keep using the abilities. Like you can jump over to the other tree and you can keep using your other abilities, but typically they have a penalty of some kind. Yeah, it like, costs more time, or, or, or uh, more. spells are, are a lot less likely to hit. Yeah, that's when I so, ran into was <laughs> I was trying to use some white magic on one of my squires, and I didn't realize oh uh, the accuracy is going to be zero on a heal. That's no bueno. But you know, you you can do those sorts of things. You don't a hundred percent lose functionality of these other 
job classes that you've trained. Yeah, I do like the custom, uh, uh, just how customizable the different char- uh, characters are through the job system. And I will say that yeah. it's, I think it's the most in-depth job system I've played in a Final Fantasy game, to be fair. I haven't done a lot of Final Fantasy games that have job systems. The only one that really jumps out in my mind right now is the Dress Fear system out of Final Fantasy X-2. And depending on how you want to stretch it, even uh, the Sphere Grid out of the uh, first Final Fantasy X, which sounds a little odd way to phrase it, but let's go with it. Uh, where yeah. it was essentially the idea of any character could learn about anything, only some are better at some things than others. Final Fantasy XIV, the MMO, has got the full-blown job system. Well, even better is uh, Final Fantasy XIV is set in the same world as Final Fantasy Tactics. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's got all the jobs and more. Um, they include a lot of sort of non-combat type skills as jobs, like mining and cooking and crafting and things. Well, I know but what you utilizes... leveled up. <laughs> but it utilizes a lot of the same principles in, you know, you have to, to, to get certain jobs, you have to level up the, the prerequisite jobs and, you know, whatever your primary class is or primary job is the one that you get bonuses in. And it, it's got all of that. But Final Fantasy fourteen is an MMO, in case mm-hmm. you're listening and you don't know what it is. Um, it's yeah, it's the different... second Final Fantasy MMO, isn't it? Yeah, Final Fantasy eleven was an MMO. Yeah, which... I don't know if Final Fantasy I've eleven always, made, like I've always disagreed with having the numbered versions be MMOs. No, just because it makes them, uh, you know, confusing. <laughs> Final Fantasy is just confusing. True. All of their their worlds and how some of them are connected and some of them aren't, and ju- where they some of them jump around in time. I don't know. They're all very confusing. I mean, I like most of the Final Fantasy games, but confusing. Uh, sort of like but, how Final know, Fantasy VIII is confusing as hell. Yeah, I love Final Fantasy VIII though. Uh, but you can't argue that it isn't confusing as hell. Oh no, it's very confusing. It's very strange. Once you start jumping to like, you jump to like the three soldier guys, and it's like, what the? Where did this come from? What does this have to do with anything? Even though they do have a good soundtrack. Yeah, but the whole idea behind that is that Squall is dying, and he's like having hallucinations. Uh, I don't that, think, that's that's not explicitly stated as canon. Um, but that's like one of the theories. that's seven. Or did I say Squall? Uh, well, no, yeah, I thought, no, I thought you said is seven. I, Squall I, I, is I, thought, I thought you said Cloud there for a moment. No, sorry, I said Squall. Uh, you know, this has happened two or three times already. Like we've drifted off to talk about <laughs> other things instead of Final Fantasy Tactics, and I think that says more about Final Fantasy Tactics than us talking about it. The fact that we can't find enough to discuss the story. Neither of us got super far into the story. The story is confusing. <laughs> just like all fantasy uh, stories. Honestly, reading the synopsis uh, just confused the hell out of me. Uh, but essentially, from what I understood, the two protagonists, the one that you could troll and the one that's essentially with you the entire time, uh, are basically the two versions of how you, how you could be good in the world, you know, just doing good things for others and not expecting... Uh, uh, recognition and then manipulating others to do good. And Carrie, guess who gets ahead? <laughs> <laughs> the manipulators. Yeah, but then yeah, uh, the truth comes out later on because this is uh, the entire game is told through a historian uh, historian finding the true history of uh, this war that happened hundreds of years ago. So, yeah, yeah it, it gets very confusing. <laughs> Even just the opening cutscene is you know, kind of a head-scratcher because it's just a wall of text. Yeah, and in 97, they didn't have very many 
like in any game, very many like things like fully voice cutscenes. Well, well, why was like it? That. Well, it's not even just fully voice cutscenes. It's the fact that it's all slowly scrolling text. Yeah, and maybe this can't skip yeah, or speed up. Yeah, maybe this is just me being you know a you know a, a dirty modern gamer, but I would have loved to had the ability to just you know, speed up the text. <laughs> You know, I mean, I can read a lot faster than the scroll speed. Oh, there was you several know. times, yeah, my attention just started to drift off. Yeah, I understand having a slow crawl in case people are slow readers, but the way you solve that is instead of making it crawl on its own, you either make it like a page system, or you, you know, have a, where the player can scroll but, it up and down. Yeah, but once and again, then you can read it as fast as you can. But once again, this is modern game design, right? Versus yeah. you know, a twenty-year-old game. Yeah, I suppose too. Thinking about that, actually, that would have been you know precious coding resources to put something in to allow the player to control the movement of the text. Well, it really depends on how they handle it, and also it. Well, how they handle it, and also you know just you know how much behind-the-scenes stuff that requires. Because I have absolutely no clue. Yeah, that's true. I don't know. We've got a people who, a couple of people that listen to the show that do programming to some extent. If you know, let us know. VGLpodcast at gmail.com. Ding. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this story is divided into four chapters uh, that are all very long. But I don't, I don't know. <laughs> do you have anything else you want to say about it? Uh, are we really going to hit our original estimate? of about half an hour on this maybe we're at about a half an hour well no we're at less because we spent like six minutes yeah true at the beginning of the show it feels you know like a disservice not talking about it longer because you know this is a part of gaming history it, this is the beginning of a sort of a kind of a, a resurgence or you know a, a popularization of the tactics games uh, is probably off base but this is the first one that I really remember hearing a lot about that isn't PC centric and that's not a modern tactics game in the sense that Final Fantasy Tactics was but also uh, this was the first of a three game series for the Final Fantasy Tactics uh, uh, sub branch of uh, the mar- of the uh, IP, so yeah, yeah. it's just it feels weird getting this over so quickly because I was expecting this to be a lot longer of a discussion, but it's just maybe it's just sometimes you can't go back, you know. Yeah, I think I will. And someone might hear this and think I'm speaking blasphemy, but I think probably the best place to play this is on mobile because they remade Final Fantasy Tactics the or reported it. Um, it was the War of the Lion remake or whatever. Well, they also released that on PlayStation 2. Yeah, but I think it just with ease of accessibility and the fact that it's, you know, low poly, things like that. Like, tactics games translate really well to touch screen devices. I think that might be the best place to play this, actually. I've never played it on mobile. I can't say that for sure, but I was thinking about it. And... You know, you can play it very leisurely. Wow, that, uh, it's a $12 um, game. <laughs> That's actually quite expensive yeah. on mobile. Well, most of the Final Fantasy games, though, fall into the 10 to $20 price range. They never really do sales, and they don't, you know... They, Damn, Final they, Fantasy they, they 9 is $21. Yeah, they, they say something like, we won't devalue our games just for mobile, or something like that. It's like there's no cloud support as well, which is... Odd because Cloud actually has a cameo in this. But um, you're welcome. Yeah, maybe. But, I mean, it also depends on how they handle the save system. If you could save at any time, or have like a quick save uh, system with a uh, hard like bookmarks, sort of like what I was trying to do to get past all the cutscenes. Yeah. And be able to just pick up and play a little bit more because, you know, those battles do get rather long. And I imagine that towards uh, the middle and end of the game, they get even longer as you get more units. You know, I almost grabbed it on mobile 
to play it that way instead of emulating it. But then I went, nah, I'm not going to spend any money on this. <laughs> I don't emulate it. I mean, I don't know if it would have been a good choice or not to have, have bought it on mobile and played it uh, there, Especially but. considering it's a different version because that's the remake. Yeah. But, I mean, it's mostly the same. Particularly the things like the story. But... I think I would. I think if you've never experienced it firsthand, I think you should give it a shot. It's one of those things that it's like, you know, even if you don't like it, even if it doesn't hold up well, it's one of those things that, like you said, it's a big touch point in gaming history. And I know lo- loads of people that played Final Fantasy Tactics loved it, um, and it's, you know, a, a big hit, a big touchstone in their gaming history. I think it's worth giving it. A, you know, just a quick play. Some of it, even if you don't get grabbed by it to, to go through the whole thing. Just to experience it a little bit. Since you can do it, you know, for free with emulation. Um, if you're looking for and if you're looking for something to try, maybe yeah, uh, if you've got a really uh, especially, older, shitty laptop. Uh, especially if you're a fan of tactics games. You know, going back and seeing not where it started, but seeing probably where it was more popularized. Because uh, Squaresoft uh, did tactics games before Final Fantasy Tactics. This was one their this wasn't their first one, if I recall correctly. But I would say that it's probably the one that you know got the most attention. I think that's a fair one to say, right? Yeah, it's definitely a, a place in gaming history. Uh, it just feels odd being done at sub 37 minutes. Well, it happens sometimes. Sometimes we talk about a game for four hours on Game Club, and sometimes it doesn't even make it to one. Yeah. Uh, what game will we be taking a gamble on next time, though? Indeed. The game that we are playing for August's Game Club is Void Bastards. Uh, if you have Game Pass, the Xbox PC Game Pass or whatever, uh, you can get it through there. Otherwise, you can get Void Bastards. It's not an, it's not an epic exclusive, is it? Can you get Void Bastards no, on Steam? No, it's on Steam. Remember, uh, okay. I mentioned seeing it on Discovery Key before. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you can get it on a variety of platforms. Um, it's also on consoles. Um, so... It is 30 bucks to buy if you don't have it or if you don't have the Game Pass. Yeah, I would suggest but, Game Pass. <laughs> it, yeah. It's 5 bucks right now. But we're going to be checking that out for August. We have got, what, three weeks? Yep. One, two, three. Yeah, yeah three it weeks should be, uh, hopefully, a uh, uh, tactics, uh, fo- or t- not tactics, uh, mechanical-based episode. So that should be plenty of time. And then we can try to get back on pace because you know we are off pace for our game club and we do have the choosing coming up for the rest of the year so if you have suggestions do. uh now is a good time to do so you can send them to vglpodcast at gmail.com or tweet them VGL podcast. yep so to the news yeah good thing i did a news sweep huh yep uh, our first news topic of the night, E3 accidentally leaks personal details of journalists, YouTubers, and analysts. Yeah, this is one of those facepalm moments, huh? Yep. The, uh, let's see, the, the total, the total number. Over 2,000. details of, yeah, 2,025 games industry journalists and video producers. Basically, if you attended E3 in a professional capacity, guess what? All that information that you gave them, uh, it's out in the wild now as a easily downloadable uh, spreadsheet. And there's people talking about that this isn't the first year that this has happened. This is just the first year that it's become a well-known thing. And wow, I think that's the I think that's the big thing to say is just wow, just how inept is the ESA because this is run by the ESA. <laughs> this isn't some third party. This is the electro or sorry, the entertainment software association. 
Yeah. It's really shitty. They didn't, they, so they have formally apologized. When the article was first written, they had not. Uh, I'm looking to see if there's a date on the update to this. I don't see one. But uh, they released a full explanation and apology for the data leak. Oh, what's your explanation? I, I, I'm going to know Allow me to read. The statement read, The Entertainment Software Association was made aware yesterday of a website vulnerability on the exhibitor portal section of the E3 website. Unfortunately, a vulnerability was exploited, and that list became public. We uh, regret this happened, and are sorry. Yeah, that's a lot. We, pro- we provide ESA members and exhibitors a media list on a password-protected exhibitor site so they can invite you to the E3 press event, connect with you for interviews, and let you know what they are showcasing. For more than 20 years, there has never been an issue. When we found out, we took down the E3 exhibitor portal and ensure the media list was no longer available on the E3 website. Again, we apologize for the inconvenience you have already, and have already taken steps to ensure this will not happen again. I mean, that's great and all. Yeah, but I also an uh, outright lie, according to the whistleblower that blew the case up, because according to her, she contacted the ESA directly for a month to try to get them to do something. And they refused to do so. So she posted a video to blow the lid off of it. So, yeah. There's nothing on here also about whether or not they're going to do anything about um, any kind of identity theft protection for people involved in this. Because, I mean, basically, E3 slash the ESA just doxed 2,025 people. And these types of breaches... Typically, a company will will reach out. I guess the ESA is not technically a company, though. But the entity will reach out and say, hey, we're going to extend this identity theft protection. And that doesn't guarantee anything for the long term. But it, you know, if you properly utilize that time to change any necessary information or take precautions otherwise, you can help protect yourself from further issue. But there's nothing in here about them doing that. But that requires the ESA to actually take uh, responsibility. And uh, based on their track record as of late, um, yeah, I I, I would be surprised if they do anything of taking responsibility short of getting sued. And according to a few places I've seen, people have a case, especially if they live in Europe. (laughs) Yeah. To me, this just feels like them going, oops, our bad. We'll do better later. Yeah, if you didn't want us to leak your info, you shouldn't give us your info. Which, in this situation, it's on the entity, the company, the the whatever. The person who's putting, or the the group that is putting on the, the trade show, essentially. Yeah, especially considering who, it's... The big trade organization in said industry. I mean, this isn't some fly by nut company that you would, uh, you know, it's like, oh, of course that's a scam. Of course they're going to leak their info. Of course they're going to have laughable uh, security. It's the ESA. I mean, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the person that uh, started it, um, Sophia Narwitz. Uh, given that the ESA just caused a lot of suffering for many game journalists, I actually hate being on the offensive here, but why folks in the media are lying about me trying to bury me, it makes me really want to scream in, uh, about their lack of ethics. This is the person that blew the whistle on the ESA. Essentially having a spreadsheet of all the, uh, all this info. Oh, oh, here's the, here's the even better part. All right. It's trackable via Google. <laughs> Is it a Google Doc? A Google no, Sheet? No, 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 no. The Google web crawler that powers the Google search engine. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, essentially goes goes through and you know finds all those sites to dump into the big bin to be sorted. It was found by that. Oh, nice. I mean, that's literally the first thing that you start blocking is web crawlers like that. 
It is absurdly laughable, their lack of tech skills or webmastering skills or whatever. It's just, what the? Yeah. And I realize I'm probably getting a lot of details wrong. And the people that uh, web develop out there, and I know that there's a couple that at least have some info on it, are probably just shaking their head. Uh, feel free to write in to correct me on this because I actually welcome the corrections to be able to yeah, be knowledgeable on it myself. But at the same time, it's just, oh, I- I'm just flabbergasted. Yeah. I feel like this is one of those things that it's like, there- there's a lot of stuff that someone can do as like an oopsie, kind of a dumb mistake. And it's like, oh, whatever, that's fine. But this is major stuff. Like you can't have oopsies about pers- people's personal, identifiable information. And going back to something you said a minute ago where she was, uh, what did you say the, the YouTuber's name was? Uh, Sophia Narwitz. Uh, she's, uh, well, I'm going through some of the tweets now. So going back to Sophia, when the, you know, with her saying like, I hate to be on the offensive, but like they're trying to bury me basically. I mean, that's unfortunately how whistleblowers are treated in America. You know, and I don't want to go too far off on a political tangent, but to go oh, no, slightly go for, uh, on feel one, free to go slightly on one. I mean, that's how whistleblowers are treated in this country, unfortunately, because you know, we, we don't want to. The idea of any of these organizations, companies, corporations, whatever, having to take responsibility for the shit that they fuck up is like, that's a a taboo, a dirty no-no. And anybody who exposes that, they must be punished. Yeah, she has actually a very long uh, series of tweets here. I'm going to copy and paste the uh, lead one so we could read through these. Basically, she's defending, uh, she's have to go on the defensive now, which is... Sad. Let's see. Where are you going to paste it to? I'm going to paste it into the document. As okay. As uh, where is it on here? Because that's the... Uh, or can I just copy and paste that? Because I'm typically, I typically use TweetDeck, but I don't have it installed on Firefox. Uh, okay, there it goes. Uh, it's bolded, so... Uh, oh, well. This is her recounting, uh, as we headed to Monday, I think it's to, safe to assume that the, uh, that the hits aimed at me are only just beginning. Uh, I have to crash soon for a very long sleep as I've only been grabbing a couple hours here and there as this weekend dragged on and I'm fucking exhausted. My head actually hurts. But while I'm away, please don't let journalists continue to sm- uh, their smears. I've uploaded three videos this weekend, which I unfortunately haven't watched because I didn't think, yeah. I didn't, I didn't consider that, sorry, this is me editorializing. I didn't consider that she would be drugged through the mud like this. Each one proves, uh, and I clicked on that. Each one proves how I handled the leak and abuse I've received from the media. I've been completely transparent and is, uh, and always in the open. Don't let the, the lies spread. Here are the facts with timestamps for everything. I've received an email at 1, uh, 53 a.m. I checked my inbox shortly after two. After checking the info presented for myself, I text the industry uh, friend at 2.45 a.m. and called another industry friend at 2.41 uh, and 3. Which she has uh, chat logs for this. Uh, uh, four or six. Uh, in uh, between two calls, I reached out to the ESA and left a voicemail. So, okay, so this wasn't uh, as long ago as I thought it was on this, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, less than an hour later, I replied to the initial email and begged the person to not share the file around this time and also reached out to a different YouTuber or a different journalist, sorry, uh, while talking uh, to uh, one of the journalists. I then reached out to a voice journalist and asked uh, him to warn journalists that this file was out in the open. And then I emailed the ESA to ensure that they got my message and I never once heard back from them. This is uh, me being at my most transparent. And as soon as I knew the fall, uh, I alerted anyone I could, including enemies uh, claims. I purposely doxed 2000 individuals is not just fa- false. It's offensive. 
You could uh, see my scramble as I tried to contain it with the timestamps above. I mean, essentially, as soon as it was out in the open, she put out a video warning people. So uh, I don't see you know, where she did wrong. She didn't uh, you know, say, oh, OK, go download this so we could dox people. She started telling people in the industry to uh, start protecting themselves. And it got out. Probably somebody trying to uh, yeah, be the first one to get the news out, you know, for those precious clicks. And here we are, right? Yep. Here we are. And based on some of the reports I've seen, uh, this isn't the first year that this has happened either. This is what I've heard personally. I haven't gone this and tried. This is the first year they've been caught. This is the first so year they've speak. been caught, according to what I've heard, because people went back in the Wayback Machine and found the file is there for previous years. So, yeah, a little troubling, huh? Yes. But ever, but uh, the games industry loves a boogeyman just as much as politicians do, right? Or a boogie yeah. woman in this case, I guess. Oh, in my head, I'm picturing just like a lady out on the dance floor, like cutting a rug. She's doing the boogie woogie. Well, uh, at yes, least it's at, at least it's better than a female uh, boogie that I, I envisioned there for a moment. I, I like your version better. <laughs> yeah, actually, no. Now I'm specifically picturing the scene from Pulp Fiction where they go to the like the 1950s diner and they're dancing <laughs> on the dance floor. That's specifically what I'm picturing. I need to go back and watch Pulp Fiction again because that's one of those movies I've always caught in bits and pieces, and I'm not sure if I've watched the entire thing. Ooh, ooh, ooh. We could do that. We can do that for a hand. I love Pulp Fiction. Uh-oh. It's my favorite movie of all time. I haven't seen it in a few years. I've been wanting to watch it. Uh, well, I've, uh, you, it's, you want a field trip, I guess. Uh, well, I'm not sure Pulp Fiction counts as a field trip. I have feelings about it, but I'm not <laughs> those kinds of feelings. But yeah, we can we can watch that maybe together one Sunday night. But anyways, the slight slight distraction mm-hmm. off topicness, whatever. Yeah. Oh, it's on Netflix. Oh, it's cool. I didn't know that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I've never heard of Sophia Narwitz before this um yeah she's a games journalist it looks like she was tipped off by somebody else so yeah i hope everything turns out okay for her like i hate that i have to say it like that because she didn't do anything wrong yeah yeah from the sounds of it uh it sounds like i had it a little bit wrong uh, myself that she put out a video about it it seems like she put out a video after it got out you know she was quietly trying to alert people behind the scenes But uh, that's the thing is that it's a lot easier to point and say, you did something instead of, oh, we fucked up. Yeah. I just had my time uh, 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 frames wrong on that. So, yeah, I screwed up on that one. But, hey, uh, you know, uh, they were very quick on shutting that down and uh, they didn't uh, let the file get out at all. Right. Right. <laughs> uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the ESA does uh, next year for E3. Assuming that they have E3. Because I'm really starting to wonder if E3 still has a place in games media. That is a larger question that I don't think is really affected by this. Because what what will happen with this is that they'll just come back and say, you know... If it comes up again or when it comes up again closer to E3 2020, be like, yes, no, we have addressed the issue internally. We fixed it going forward. This won't happen again. Yeah, Bob got fired. Nobody will care. Yeah, Bob got fired. Steve's got his job now. Glad it's not It's all good. (laughs) But, you know, and then everything will, you know, just get swept away and move on with the hype machine that is E3. Does E3 have a place in modern gaming press? That is a larger question. And a good general topic at some point. Indeed. But I think that this incident is irrelevant to that overall. 
just because of how the industry and in general, like most. Well, I think it's more. Stories. I'm proposing it just because people are going to be a little bit more hesitant about E3. Yeah, but see, we've run into the same issue that we come up with uh, with other things. Like uh, you and I and many listeners yeah. of this podcast are enthusiasts who actually care. The majority of the gaming public doesn't know and won't give two shits about. Yeah, but the thing a, is, a this doesn't document. affect the gaming public. This it. is the journalist, or sorry, the bloggers. Yeah, I know, but the hype machine has to keep going. So, new journalists and bloggers and YouTubers will go to the show because the public who doesn't know and doesn't care will still, you know need to be served i don't know quite the right way to say that but you know the audience still exists and so all of these other you know faceless corporations and then also the individuals who you know are are trying to go it solo or a part of small groups or whatever like they're gonna go out there anyways which is cynical and it for me to say that and think that way but it's true and it's shitty but this incident won't matter to yeah what's the line from men in black a person could be smart but people as a whole are dumb panicky animals yeah something like that so we can have that general discussion at another time though uh, especially closer to e3 you know get those clicks yeah <laughs> those sweet sweet downloads uh, speaking of uh, sweet downloads, well, if you download Doom uh, uh, Remake uh, close to launch, it wasn't so much of a sweet download. Nope. Bethesda's missteps, the Doom re-release. Oh, Bethesda. So, <laughs> they did some stuff that's a little odd, but not too bad. And then they did some really bad stuff. Uh, the uh, one I saw going around, it started off with Jim Sterling tweeting out a picture of the original Doom, all right. I'm talking '90s Doom with please signing in, uh, sign into your Bethesda account plastered over. And I thought, oh, that's a cute joke. I wonder uh, uh, what Jim's making fun of. It's not making fun of anything. That was an actual screenshot. <laughs> Guess it was. Um, Bethesda has said uh, that that was for the specifically for the Slayers Club. Not as DRM, but I don't believe them. I think they uh, went as DRM and they got caught, and they got caught in backlash. Yeah, I mean, basically, your two choices with that are incompetence because they fucked it up, or malice. But neither of them are good. But with Bethesda at this point, I think it's malice. Uh, which, On the dark side. which. Considering Bethesda, the fact that we're not going in competence is, you know, saying a lot, huh? Yeah. Um, but aside from the DRM in Doom and Doom 2, did Doom 3 have the DRM as well? Uh, remember. yes. Okay, so aside uh, from the DRM... According to the intro on this. Uh, some other things, uh, these were, are, are less, they're just a little more weird. They changed the tempo of the music in these like it, it's slower and i saw that from modern modern vintage gamer talking about it in his video discussing these issues yeah the first two uh, the doom mo- games uh, only support local uh, co-op and doom 3 re-release is a single player title yeah so th- but the so yeah uh, but that's why it's weird to have the online uh, requirement sorry yeah no you're fine uh and then the the, the music is slower in in doom 1 and 2 doom 3 is basically exactly like it is on um console and pc like you know it's it's it's, it's exactly the same as the older version and then there were were some slight differences with other like sound effects and things for the most part he specifically modern vintage gamer thought they sounded better i didn't really give a shit i've seen people say that it sounds worse and they don't like the the audio remaster I think that's more purely personal preference but the music being at a slower tempo is weird it's not quite as frantic feeling or sounding and i don't know if that was deliberate or if that was accidental or what but it's it's a little weird yeah i wonder if that's to be able to pick out gameplay between the old and new versions i know we're going up with malice again but 
uh, because if there was a tempo difference, you'd be able to definitely tell, you know, okay, this is the re uh, re release or remaster or yeah. whatever. Possibly. Um, some other things with it, uh, you can't get Doom One and Two on, on Xbox Live anymore. Yeah, yeah, they pulled uh, it right. Yeah, you previously could get those from the old school Xbox Live Arcade, and I think they were still purchasable through the more modern like Microsoft Xbox Store or whatever. But they're pulled. If you have copies on your Xbox account, you can still download and play them, but uh, you can't purchase them anymore. So I think those were. Oh, uh, so in other words, they went uh, Ghostbusters with that, where they pulled the original version and uh, hey, the re-release. Oh, but it's not available on your platform. Yeah. Yeah, that's a shitty thing that they're doing with Ghostbusters, huh? Yeah. So it looks like actually initially that no, you even if you had it, you couldn't download it. Um, and Bethesda said that was a mistake, and they have, air quotes, corrected that. Yeah, how nice of them so. you know, uh, to fix a mistake like that. Because they yeah. de- that definitely wasn't built around uh, selling the same game again. How nice of them to give somebody a game back that that person already purchased. Yeah, I'm mighty fond of them. But those are all of the major issues with it. But this whole thing is just... I mean, you Doom runs on refrigerators. It runs on printers. <laughs> calculators and printers. It runs on cars. Like, I've seen people who have used uh, the actual, like, things like the steering wheel and the gear shifter and, like, cars that have built-in, you know, screens and things to play Doom. You know, Doom runs on everything. So it's so weird to see, like, you can buy this game, but it is noticeably shittier than any um, copy you can get for free online anywhere else and then make it run on basically any platform you want also known as modern re-releases these days yeah and with a lot of games they have and could get away with it but doom is ubiquitous in gaming everyone basically has either owns or has owned or has played doom uh, if not the full version point. the shareware version because yeah. remember this was back when demos were a thing, and they were called shareware. Yeah, you could play, was it the first two levels? Yeah, I think so. Or was it just the first level? I know it was at least the first full level, but uh, I remember playing the shareware version. I don't think I ever played the full version. But honestly, it, I wasn't much of a per- first-person shooter fan back in the day, so I, I, yeah, it, it didn't click with me, but I played it. Yeah. I've played through all of Doom 1. Um, I've played some of Doom 2. I've never actually owned Doom 2. And then I played through all of Doom 3. And then I've played through Doom... The one that they made in, what, 2015 or 2016? The uh, the remaster? Or, or sorry, uh, the reboot, essentially. The reboot? Yeah, I've played the Doom reboot. Yeah, which the Doom reboot uh, was uh, was really good. Uh, It had a tact on multiplayer that, honestly, it didn't seem like many people played. But I'm a little concerned what they're going to do with Doom Eternal. You know, the next one of the reboot series. Because, you know, this is Bethesda. And, you know, uh, the first Doom was a surprise hit. Yeah. And I hate having to have this attitude, but it feels like the safe attitude these days. It doesn't feel like I'm being pessimistic. It feels like I'm being you know, uh, safe in my assumptions because the games industry is just you know, trying to screw us over. I mean, that's one of the best, honestly, that's one of the best attitudes to take in order to protect yourself and your wallet from, you know, being taken in by all this bullshit. It's just be skeptical of everything they say and do. Which sucks. I hate having to be that way, but... But been lied to too often. Yeah. I mean, been lied to by Bethesda uh, specifically (laughs) in the last, what, year and a half, two years? Yeah. I mean, I buy very few AAA titles at all anymore. Used, almost never new, rarely used. I stick to mostly indies, you know, 
or older games that I have played. I'm trying to think what the actual last triple A game I bought was. I mean, it's definitely going to be on sale. I mean, there's no doubt about that. But yeah, what would it be? Monster Hunter World was the last AAA game that I bought brand new. La- I bought, I got that. I, don't last know, I year. guess that would count. Sleeping Dogs. Uh, but that's the definitive edition. That's yo know, uh, was on sale for what two dollars? Uh, yeah, something like that. It was very cheap. Yeah, one of our game club pickups. Uh, let's see. I guess, uh, I guess Borderlands, uh, the Handsome Jack edition would uh, be beyond that. But even then, that was, you know, sub five. Which, yeah, I feel bad about getting that. But that was still, uh, in February. And once again, yeah, that's, you know, a very old game. Uh, I'm just, I'm scrolling through my purchase history. <laughs> which is always, a uh, you know, odd to go through. It's like, Oh, wait, I bought that? Why did I buy that? <laughs> yeah. And then I haven't bought a brand new console game in years. I haven't bought a console game in years. I haven't bought a console in years. Fair. So. I, I can't... Well, yeah, well, well, it's double A, but the, the last... Uh, even approaching to a play game I bought on release was Battletech. But that's, you know, not even fair because that was Game Club. Yeah. Good old Battletech. Special place in my heart. You know, you may uh, want to okay. uh, get the mech out of your heart because, you know, uh, uh, clogged arteries are a bad sign. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Plus heavy metal poison. Mo- yeah, several tons of it. But ouch. Um, are you ready to move on and discuss our final third and final news topic of the night? I believe so. So Google is testing a Play Pass subscription model for Android, which uh, this isn't the first time we've seen something like this for mobiles because Apple has this, but. It's an interesting thing, mostly because Google has more of an emphasis on gaming than Apple does. I think that's fair, right? A uh, sorta. Do they? Uh, Apple. I don't know. Apple Actually, always I'm has tried in- to de-emphasize their gaming side of things uh, in marketing. Yep. I mean, I haven't been in the Apple environment since I was in grad school and had to have a stupid, shitty <laughs> iPad for for stuff. No, tell me how you really feel. And how does this make you feel? Fuck fuck Apple products, man. (laughs) Uh, But, yeah, uh, famously, Steve Jobs didn't want games on the iPhone. So that's why I've always kind of uh, thought of them as, you know, de-emphasizing gaming, even though, you know, it probably is their biggest money maker outside of like iTunes. Yeah, I mean at one point they very possibly could have uh, or did have that attitude, but I mean there have still been plenty of games that I've played that were exclusive to the the app app store, the mm-hmm. Apple store. Yeah, but I think that's also more that the boy, this is uh, going to probably come out wrong, but let's go with it anyway. Uh, the iPhones are a more closed off system and uh, far less prone to uh, to piracy than Android phones are. No, I'm not, I'm not going full AAA game developer and saying all uh, Android users are pirates. However, piracy is a much bigger problem on Android because it's a more open system because, you know, Android it's better. <laughs> okay. It's uh, not as locked down, so you don't have to root your phone to be able to do little things like install apps from other places. Yeah. Android is getting more and more locked down on certain Yeah, on certain phones. features, yeah. 
Yeah, I've noticed a bit of a difference on uh, my phone, which is a version of Android ahead of yours. Yeah. Where uh, certain things I have to uh, go and change uh, specifically to be able to allow. Uh, so, they, But they are also becoming a lot more clear on what data uh, apps are able to access. So, you know, it's a give and take there. But it's not quite gone full Apple. But, hey, uh, Samsung is getting rid of uh, uh, headbud ports or uh, three and a half millimeter jack. So there, we are getting there. Yeah. I'm going to miss them when they're gone. But I don't use them that often, I'm... but it's good to have them. Yeah. I still use them all the time, but I've got Bluetooth uh, headsets and um, headphones. Mm -hmm. I just need to find... The the issue with the Bluetooth earbuds is that getting ones that fit and feel right while having batteries in them. Yeah. Because even though it's not a lot, that little bit of weight is enough to drag down on your ears and feel weird or pull them out. So yeah, the actually the little cheap ones I have are pretty good. Only problem is, and this is a first world problem if uh, there ever is one. The grocery store near where I live, there's something about their doors that puts out enough RF uh, interference that if I'm near the store, it'll cause my earbuds to drop. That's interesting. Yeah, even back in the day when uh, radar detectors were a big thing, uh, before, I I'm not sure if they're actually illegal here, but I know a lot of states cracked down on radar detectors. And uh, then cops moved away from radar to uh, uh, less detectable laser, and you know, you know but you know, that's getting beside the point. Uh, they it gave off enough uh, interference that it was pickable, uh, uh, picked up on some radar detectors. So maybe I should call the FCC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like uh, worth a shot. Yeah, some sort of weird interference uh, with their door system. Or at least that's what I always heard. It was the doors, but it could be something else. Who knows? Maybe they're running a big pot, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, plantation underground and it's all the lights giving off some sort of interference or something. Which makes no sense because, of course, uh, being West Virginia, they would have switched to meth ages ago. And yes, they would have. <laughs> you got me there. That's more impo way more important than the point I was going to... Or the joke I was going to make. Way, way more on point? <laughs> yeah, way more on point. Uh, but Almost getting back getting back to the point. <laughs> so this isn't strictly gaming. Uh, some of the screenshots have, uh, that's been shown shows this is a more general uh, application uh, subscription service, but there are some games on it. Uh, the one that I keep seeing people talked about uh, talking about is Stardew Valley. Which is still, you know, like a ten dollar game. Yeah, it's a, one of the higher priced games. Uh, let's see, what's uh, Android Police has some screenshots. Uh, unfortunately, I don't recognize a lot of these, but uh, I see Brothers of Tale Two Sons at uh, Threes, Ticket to Ride, the Limbo. Okay, I guess I do recognize a few of these. Uh, Star Wars, uh, Knights of the Old Republic, Terraria, uh, Stardew Valley, Monument Valley. So, uh, a couple things with Elmo, a, a Risk game. Uh, that looks like Life is Strange. Yeah, it does. Uh, this is The Police. So, you know, a fair number of games on here. But it's also going to be more than that. Oh, there's a, a Game Dev Tycoon as well. Uh, they've talked about it being more than just games. Uh, having, uh, oh, that, oh, that's definitely Stardew Valley. Uh, Marvel Pinball as well. Where, yeah, uh, uh, no, be, oh, was, well, the problem with uh, apps in general is that they've been so devalued, just with so much trap out there, and how the payment model has switched over to a. Uh, microtransaction fueled economy. So 
yes, ten dollars for Stardew Valley is actually a hell of a lot cheaper than it is on PC most of the time. But I'm more hesitant on mobile because I have this association with mobile of things being very cheap on there and I don't do as much on there. Whenever I get an app, it's usually for a very specific reason and then I do whatever I need it for and then I, you know, it just stays installed as essentially a, a tool in the tool belt. So having a subscription model where you're able to get the full versions of everything without all the bullshit marketing, all the microtransactions, and be able to pull you know, what you need out of it when you need it, assuming that there is more than just games. Yeah, I think it's a, a very powerful method of getting people more accustomed to a less advertising-driven infrastructure for mobile. Yeah. There is a, this this thing, you know, going you were saying talking about devaluing. Like it's very weird to think about having a subscription for stuff like this on, on yeah. mobile. Like there's certain mobile subscription related stuff that makes a lot of sense. Like Google's got like the family thing you can subscribe to and you can share like all of your apps and movies and audio books. Well, I was going to say even Netflix. just music and uh, video to begin with because you know, yeah, Netflix uh uh well, not iTunes, but uh, you know, uh, Amazon Music, uh, Google Music. I mean, it, it mostly comes down, and, and to some extent it comes down to, you know, how much of a mobile gamer are you? You know, how much are you interested in playing some of these things on mobile? How used to you are mo- the mobile control interface for a lot of games? Like, I have KOTOR on mobile. I, it was at, at one point like a giveaway, either on the Play Store or through Amazon Prime or something like that, like the mobile version of it was. And that game is hot garbage on mobile. It plays like ass and controls like shit. Like, never in a million years would would that add value to the service for me. But there might be someone who that's primarily but how they what game if, is on mobile but devices. But what if they and, uh, add more? What if it's just the, uh, more than games? You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's what I was uh, saying before is that. According to some of the leaks, it's more than just a gaming service. If they roll it into one of their existing programs or create a new one that's like, you can get everything for this monthly fee, or you can get, you know, YouTube Red and, I don't know, something else or or whatever, like, that's fine. Like, that's probably makes it worth it. I might be interested in that, but, you know, with the games being their primary sort of selling point i don't think that there's anything in there that interests me because i'm not afraid to spend five or ten dollars on a mobile game that i think will be good and worth my time i've, I've got several that i have bought over the years that i have really <coughs> enjoyed and i'm okay with spending two three five ten bucks for a two-hour game if it's really really good and utilizes in some way not necessarily but Potentially utilizes in some way the unique way that touchscreen devices can be. Oh, sort of like Monument Valley. That was a good example. Of yeah. That. Where, uh, yeah. yes, it would have been playable on PC, but uh, there's something a lot more tactile about uh, grabbing and pulling with a touchscreen. Mm-hmm. Or twisting around and that sort of thing, which I definitely get. But I haven't had enough good experience with mobile game. I, I, as a matter of fact, I've had. Uh, kind of the opposite, where I've uh, felt a little bit burned a couple times, that I'm more hesitant. Plus, I have a library on a PC that I can fall back on instead. So, you know, it's more, what do they have beyond gaming? If they have uh, apps that are already a subscription service rolled into this, like, uh, well, one of my uh, apps I use a lot is a cookbook app. Well, the cloud storage on that is a subscription that I don't want to buy into, so I just manually save it to Dropbox every so often. If that's rolled in, it would be a lot more uh, appealing to me because that's something like a 40 or $50 a year subscription that you have to buy yearly. So you can see where I'm getting at now, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I realize it's not much per month, 
but having to take it as a bigger bite at a time, you know, is a less than ideal method. Yeah. I mean, this is interesting, and I hope it works out for them. I personally like the streaming or the subscription model for a lot of games. Like, every medium so far has been irrevocably changed. In some ways, negative, for sure. But I think in more ways, more positively, by the advent of streaming services and subscription-type services... And gaming is heading in that direction, and there's some shitty ones, and there's some good ones. And, you know, if it turns out to be a good one and and helps to push it in a more positive direction overall, potentially that other developers can copy or whatever, like, I don't think it's a bad idea. But I just don't quite understand who it's for. But maybe that's mostly me, just because I'm not, a you know, a big mobile gamer. So Maybe it's for more of the people that are dabbling in mobile gaming that don't want to take the commitment. Because if you look at uh, the price difference, okay, so let's just take Stardew Valley. I mean, that's two months of uh, the subscription just on that one game. Instead, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to like this. I'll get a month uh, to try out a bunch of different things and use it as sort of a, a test bed or someone that gets bored of games very quickly and when it wants to move on to something else but not feel like they're wasting their money. Yeah. Uh, that's where I'm seeing it. Or maybe... A, uh, a family service, yeah. I would love it if they just rolled it into their existing service packages. But, I mean, they're not going to do that, at least at first. Yeah, because that would be money on the table. Indeed. So, with that out of the way, I think, I don't know, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I just found it to be very interesting. So, uh, that's why I put it on the docket. Uh, I, I want to see what they actually do with this and what the actual uh, service has in place before I make my final judgment on it. It feels weird that I'm playing devil's advocate on it, though. Because right. usually I'm the cynic. Yeah, usually I'm the one who's playing devil's advocate. I'm not quite so cynical on this as I am compared to the other news topics we've had tonight. I just am not quite sure. You know, I guess it needs to prove itself first. I'm not like poo pooing this one. I like, like I said, I like subscription services. Well, maybe you need like. some more fiber. <laughs> uh, but you know, maybe it just needs it. It just needs to to be a thing that we can kind of interact with and see how they handle stuff. I think at this point. Mm. Um. So we will hit a real quick community corner. We did not have any uh, letters sent in. Yeah, no tweets. Uh, just really briefly, Game Club, or not Game Club, Game Night, Community Game Night. Uh, we played... Oh, I'm in Craig's thing. Black Ops. I'm like, why can't I see the pinned... Yeah, we played Black Ops last night. Had a... Uh, and it's Defcon next good week. Good time with that. Ne- yep, next week is Defcon. Um, there are some changes to the list that are not reflected in the pinned, uh, Google doc. Like you have to actually go to it, but there have been some people who have added or have made suggestions, which have been added to the list. I need to actually add the one that you suggested to me. And I said, yes, we should do that. Um, I'm doing that right now. Yes, I can see it. So the, uh, the list goes out to the 9th of September so far. Uh, at least for games that are on the list, and it's extended out through the end of the year. Um, so if anybody's got any suggestions, please feel free to to add them as time gets closer. If no one has made suggestions, uh, we'll make some judgment calls on putting some games on the list. But we've got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five weeks ahead planned at the moment of recording. So, but yeah, next week we'll be hitting DEF CON again. It's been a few months since we have played that. Um, I think quite a few people in the community have played that. Mm-hmm. We've all played that together. So hopefully <clears throat> between all of us, we can get a full or a near full game. Yeah. We're going to have to determine uh, about the next week though, because it's still marked to be determined. Is it? Yeah. Oh, which actual games to play on tabletop. Yeah. 
Yeah, we need to determine to be determined. We're going to do some co-op focus games. Um, we've had some issues with the more competitive nature of some of the games that we played with people winding up sitting out for nearly like an hour or something of gameplay. That's not fun, so... I blame myself. <clears throat> because that one was we've my evolved. fault. The The last one when we played um, King of Tokyo? Yeah, that one was me. But to uh, be fair, yeah, we all went super defensive on that. <laughs> yeah, so if anybody has some, some cooperative board games that you're uh, aware of in tabletop, please feel free to suggest them. Uh, Rage has suggested a couple to me previously. Might try one of those. We've got some old stand or some old favorites too that we've played, like Dead of Winter. Um, I've got a couple. I can't remember if we've played them as a group. Uh, Forbidden, no, Hidden Island, Hidden Desert, Forbidden Island and Forbidden Desert, something like uh, that. Isn't there it's a called... Robinson Caruso one that's supposed to be really good? That's cool. I don't know. I've never played it before. I don't think I've never even heard of it. Like, I mean, I've heard of Robinson Caruso, but I've never heard of a Robinson Caruso cooperative game. Um. Let's see, Robinson Crusoe Adventures on the Cursed Island. <laughs> Unfortunately, it looks like board game keep us down. But yeah. It, uh, so sorry, I was we'll looking to see just how many players it could. Play. It could play up to four players, which is about right for game night, especially a board game. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's what's coming up for game night for the next couple of weeks. Hope to see you guys there. And if you wish to let us know your game suggestions, uh, feedback on the show, or just want to say hi, vglpodcast at gmail.com, or tweet us, uh, vglpodcast on, well, the Twitter. Indeed. So does that mean it's time to doobly do over to Discovery? Yeah, as I send you a review. Uh, unfortunately, I can't continue up the uh, rhyme for Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> it's all right. Ah, oh, just you know, Steam's logged me out. Uh, it's on Discord. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I see that for what you sent me, but I'm talking about to pull up Discovery Queue. Uh, well, I have one that's uh, immediately, uh, as I usually do, because I have uh, that my Discovery Queue loaded up and ready to go. It has some mixed reviews on it, but oh, what the hell, right? Legends yep. of Ara. Discover a world forged by players where your choices write the story. From seasoned mage to ambitious warrior, from adventurous treasure hunter to skilled blacksmith, choose your path and experience in Legends of Ara. Unfortunately, let's see, uh, the developers do not have a real vision for this game. The de uh, development is based on haphazard feedback implemented in the worst way. So, sounds like there's some uh, yeah, rough times ahead, and it's an MMO. So, yo, yeah, MMO, not very popular, so you may have some problems with it, but it's interesting. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. It's early access, so, yeah, early access MMO, yeah, right? Yeah. This sounds familiar, actually. Legend of Ar Area. I, I think I, th uh, I think this may have been one of yours way back. Maybe. Uh, you get you got yours going. Yeah. <laughs> I oh, I almost never do sports games, but, but this one, Cricket Nineteen. I'm a huge, not a huge cricket fan. I like cricket. Um, I've tried watching cricket. Huge... I have no idea what the fuck. I'm a huge fan of basically anything British or English, however you want to look at that. Um, I've never actually seen a cricket game before. I'm sure they exist. They must exist. Yeah, I mean, but there's uh, there's at American, least 19 of them. <laughs> being an American, you know, we don't really see cricket in the States often or at all. So just seeing this made me be like, oh, yeah, cricket, that's fun. I've actually played cricket a couple of times. I don't understand all the rules either, despite the fact that I've played it. There's quite a few similarities to baseball, but then there are lots of things that are very different, so. But yeah, that's just kind of neat. I don't know. It tickled my fancy. And fancy your tickle. So I got Metal Wolf Chaos X 
XD. Metal Wolf Chaos XD is a modernized re-release of From Frontier's 2004 mech shooter with upgraded visual fidelity, refined controls, and gameplay. A new save system and 4K 16 by 9 support for modern displays. I mean, it's a re-release of a classic uh, mech uh, shooter. I mean, what more do you need to know, right? Yeah, uh, I remember this being announced at E3. Yeah, yeah, it's super over the top as well. Which I like things that are super over the top. I don't, I don't have another one, so. Well, I'm, I'm scrolling. Okay. And it seems like Steam is completely ignoring my broadcast settings and is starting broadcast. Whenever I'm hitting one that has a live broadcast for some reason, which is fun. Yeah. Mine does that sometimes. Uh, huh. What is this? Oh, what the hell? We'll do this one. May have to do two discovery keys because we're coming up short on the episode. Yeah. So I got I got one. Um, Interstellar Space Genesis. I mean, this looks like a space 4x game the whole you know manage everything in space develop your colonies looks like this one you can actually go down on the colony and can see oh my things. Okay. you're, you you're gonna go down on a colony it. oh yeah but you can see a space elevator and that also tickled my fancy like you don't see very many space elevators in games uh, a few but uh, mostly because yes. uh, people's realized that space elevators are very 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 difficult yeah but I still like I like space elevators. I'd love to see like something like a skyhook or something like that implemented in a game just to get like a good concept of it. Skyhooks are really weird and fascinating. But anyways, I, I won't get off to discussing space much. But yeah, I mean, I, you know, everyone knows I'm a sucker for sci-fi and strategy games and shit. So. And colonies, it seems. Yeah. So I have Remnant from the Ashes. The world has been thrown into chaos by an ancient evil from another dimension. Yo, as you do. As for, uh, as one of the last remnants of humanity, you must set out alone or alongside up to two other survivors to face down hordes of deadly enemies. So, uh, it sounds uh, like a horde shooter almost, only, uh, no, no it's a, essentially a horde shooter. The screenshots don't make it look like that. Or you know, uh, the Left for Dead model, I guess I should say. Yeah, this is one of those times that yeah, the screenshots are uh, yeah not very helpful, and even the trailer doesn't really give me an idea of what to expect from this game. That sounds interesting. Uh, who did this? Developed by Gunfire Games. Well, uh, oh, they develop. Uh, okay, so third person likely. Uh, they did Dark Siders two. So there you go, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, they also did uh, Dark Siders three. So that should give. I think that gives an idea of what to expect. So I got another one. Merchant of the Skies, uh, airship trading simulator thing. Um, think like Port Royale or any of the other number of games like that where you looks like you control. Oh, that's rather a ship cute or a fleet of ships. Yeah, uh, but it's but it's the, airships. The carrot has a top hat. Yeah, it is a very majestic carrot. He's my new best friend, the top hat carrot. Uh, well, uh, oh uh, my god, is it carrot top? Is that a play on carrot top? I don't like it anymore. I don't think so. I I like to think it, of it as a uh, yeah. A memorial to Total Biscuit because it is a top hat and it's like at the same angle he always had in his icon. Fair enough. I don't know why he's a carrot, but <laughs> and there's the fish god in the first screenshot, fish god. But yeah, I mean, who doesn't love airships and trading things and managing a fleet? I'm sold. Oh, it's only eight bucks. I might literally be sold. I wonder if I can get a key. I'll try that first, but I might be purchasing this. Well, I got a tycoon game, and I, I am a fan of management games, so Chef, a restaurant tycoon game. 
Chef is a restaurant management game in which you create your own character, acquire supreme cooking skills, customize restaurants, design uh, unique menus, and devise innovative recipes. Uh, with a real with a realistic editor. So, I mean, I've played games like this before. Uh, back in my DOS days, early Windows days, there was a uh, Pizza Tycoon, which recently saw a revival on its series. I actually, hadn't, I don't recall how it did though. I know uh, this has that sort of same feel to it. Of uh, just, you know, building up essentially a franchise of uh, restaurants, only it's not limited to pizzas. It, it looks interesting. It does look a little bit simplistic on uh, the screenshots, though, so I'm not sure how in-depth this gets. Let's see, developed by Inner Void, who's done games that I've not played or really ever even heard of. So, yeah. I mean... Uh, I do like my tycoon games, and obviously I like to cook, so... Mm, right? Perfect fit. Uh, so that's my cue. Where are you in terms of yours? Um, and four left. Doing a second one? Okay. Do you want me to go ahead and start my second one, or do you want to wait until you're done with yours and then start a second one? Well, I have another one right now. 60 seconds re -atomized. Uh, the post-apocalyptic dark comedy is back, remastered, and even more radioactive than before. So, essentially, a comedy, survival, almost visual novel. Not qu oh, okay, not quite, sorry. I didn't look at some of the screenshots. So, going out, looting, uh, I mean, it's your typical survival game, only they have a comedic element to it. I don't think I've ever even really heard of the first one, but it's also, you know, not exactly a great title to remember, you know, 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I mean, survival game. Uh, if you want to go ahead and start your queue, you can. Uh, I just got Cricket 19. <laughs> yeah, Cricket. I thought I had this before on the Discovery Cube, but um, maybe not. Oh, I got Metal Wolf. Okay, uh, I'm pretty sure I've had this before, but what the hell. Warhammer 40k. Oh, no, this is the expansion to it, isn't it? Or the standalone exp or expansion. Warhammer 40k Inquisitor Prophecy. Uh, I'm pretty sure I've had Inquisitor before, so this is... Uh, a standalone expansion to Inquisitor. It was released just uh, about a week ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, a week ago. Some mixed reviews on it, but uh, the ARPGs are a little bit subjective. Uh, same game as Inquisitor Martyr, but with more and more class and more campaign story. So it sounds almost like a re-release. Hmm, interesting. I mean, if you're a fan of ARPGs and the Warhammer 40k universe, there's something for you, right? Yeah. Let's see, VR game, I'll skip that. Uh, oh. Stop with the damn broadcasts. Yeah, mine was doing that too. So, I don't know if this has a non... Oh, uh, never mind, it requires a VR headset. Yeah, I just skipped a VR game, so... Uh, how about I go again, then, with uh, the last one on my first queue. Icterus, Lord of the Dead. This has very much a... Uh, now I'm blanking on the uh, game. Uh, Darkest Dungeon. Uh, very much a Darkest Dungeon feel to it, from the looks of it, with a little bit more of an RPG element as well. Which is not a bad thing. I haven't played a lot of Darkest Dungeon, though, so I can't really compare it that well. But it definitely has that vibe. Uh, a a turn-based tactical roguelike... Uh, a rogue, uh, I would call it roguelike RPG set in a dark fantasy universe. So if you like your dark fantasy, right? Lead yeah. an army of undead to help an angry necromancer in his quest to reach the surface world and bring death on to the mortal realms. You know, so you're the good guys, right? Possibly. Looks like it has some 
pretty bad reviews on the top uh, surface. It's mostly positive overall, but it's only 800 some reviews. Some people are saying that there's some gameplay imbalances. Uh, this game is not Darkest Dungeon, uh, like it's supposed to be similar to, uh, uh, or compared to. Uh, it looks like they're saying it's more like a tactics game, which is interesting. So, yeah, that's the end of my first queue, starting my second. Okay, I've got one, God Wars the Complete Legend. This is a tactical RPG based uh, in ancient Japan and made to be a modern spiritual successor to Final Fantasy Tactics. So I, it honestly doesn't look super great. Yeah, but maybe it is. Yeah, but I have to put it on because of the timing. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, this was originally released as a humble exclusive in the humble monthly bundle, or or the humble subscription, I should say. A short Mm -hmm. hike. A uh, walking simulator, a uh, hum, a uh, uh, hike, climb, and soar through a peaceful mountainside uh, landscapes of Hulk Peak Provisional Park as you make your way to the summit. So, walking simulator, relaxing, some hidden treasures to find, and just explore a game world. Interesting. Hey, uh, at least you're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, at the hour of politicians, right? Yeah. Well, that's so terrible. So I got one. Aeons of War. Uh, the description reads, In this fast-paced grand strategy game, you take charge of a space civilization one million years at a time, enter the ever-changing battlefield for hyperspace and energy control means survival. So I've mentioned before, I think on the show, not just in like Franken content, that I listened to a podcast called Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. But that he talks quite a bit about these really hardcore, like, scientific concepts about, like, utilizing energy from black holes and Dyson swarms and things like that. Like, capturing all of the energy and sometimes, you know, storing it for future civilization, like, billions or maybe trillions of years in the future when entropy is kind of eaten away at the universe. Seeing that potentially brought to life in game form could be really interesting. Where that instead of focusing so much on killing the other player or, you know, maxing out your research tech tree or whatever, you've really got to consider like, well, shit, these stars are actually going to die because of the timeline of the game. How do I deal with that? So they, this could be interesting. I mean, it could be hot garbage, yeah, too. Yeah, and but it has a pretty far off release date. Yeah, 2020. Planned release of 2020. Not even a date. But- yeah, I mean, that looks really yeah. interesting. So I got something that probably isn't as interesting, but eh, if you're a board game fan, maybe. Axis and Allies 1942 Online. So an online version of the classic board game Axis and Allies uh, 1942. Uh, uh, the official adaptation, I might add, of the classic board game. Uh, there's some people saying that it doesn't play as well. There's some uh, issues with it. Hopefully it gets fixed. It is an early access though. So, you know, there is a chance. Uh, Beam Dog. What has Beam Dog made? Uh, Bol- oh, a lot of the Baldur's Gate games. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, quite a few Baldur's Gate games actually. So, you know, they definitely have a, uh, a mindset for, you know, tabletop-esque mechanics so that's actually a pretty good fit so i guess see if yo how that handles Uh, i just got uh, stellar space genesis so i can skip that there's an interesting one do you have one maybe it just popped up as i skipped to the next one of my queue so you go ahead if you've got one um, in the wrong place, sorry. I got Jupiter Hell. And there is a link for you. So, a turn based shooter from the depths of cosmic hell built on a classic roguelike 
uh, framework updated with modern 3D graphics. So it's a roguelike, uh, in the actual classic sense of the term, shooter. Uh, very interesting. Uh, it still is in early access with... Uh, they plan to support the game for many years with several content updates. Uh, they have an intended release before the end of 2020, so it's early in the early access uh, run. It just released this month on the 1st. Uh, like chess with shotguns. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, so I got yeah, one interesting. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I was going to say it has uh, the only other game I could really think of that is even close to quite like this was uh, uh, it was something glitch and I'm blanking on the name, but but it wasn't a turn based. Uh, uh, to, uh, it was a turn based or I'm oh, sorry, real time two uh, beat two D shooter. So this is a lot more on the framework of Rogue, which is nice. I mean, I guess Frozen Synapse could almost get there, but not quite. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah. you were saying? Yeah, I got one. Uh, space Company Simulator. What this looks like is someone went, how do we turn SpaceX into a video game? So it looks like you're in charge of a company who is uh, doing space stuff. Is launch rockets, satellites, spaceships, and orbital stations become the new major player in the space industry. It looks like it's got, you know, tech trees. So, in other words, stuff. SpaceX Simulator? Yeah. Pretty that, much. That's interesting. Release date, through, uh, quarter three of 2019, huh? So... I have another tactical RPG. <laughs> because that's what we need right okay. now, right? Absolutely. God Wars, the complete legend, as I ta accidentally hit a thing and go away from the show notes. Well, that's just porn. Uh, no, no, it's a tactical oh, RPG. Uh, the latest in full-scale Sorry. tactical uh, RPG revealing gr uh, receiving great reviews all around uh, is finally on PC uh, Steam. Enjoy the ensemble cast of heroes who fought in ancient Japan and captured the best in tactical RPG, consisting of an overwhelming game volume of 142 battle stages and 160 hours of total gameplay. So a big tactical RPG. <laughs> I mean, it has a uh, a rather cutesy art style for war, huh? Yeah. But it does look like there's some uh, depth to it. But I definitely see the you know, the influences of uh, Final Fantasy Tactics here. But hey, they at least have the uh, battle order on the screen, so you don't have to go through two menus to find who's going to be attacking next, right? That's very nice. Very, very kind of them. Very modern. So I'm through with my second queue. I got two in that one. Oh, that's terrible. Well, that's not entirely true. I had a couple that you had already had before. Uh, I got Metal Wolf Chaos 60, uh, Legend of Aria, oh, and Remnant from the Ashes in my second queue, well, which you already yeah, had. This isn't porn, but this is going to be porn. I can tell. So let's just skip that. Uh, let's see. <laughs> well, I would put this on, but uh, there's the uh, orange box. English language not supported. Even though the entire st uh, store page is in en English. So, go figure, right? Well, that English language is just not supported. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the timing. Remember what I mentioned before about being concerned about a certain game? Yeah. It came up. Doom Eternal. <laughs> oh, nice. 
The, the reason why I'm so concerned about it, even though I haven't played the first one. Well, first of all, yeah, it has uh, a bunch of uh, pre-order bullshit, but they were talking about a hub world where you could see what the Slayer does in his downtime. Why does the Slayer have downtime? There's demons to kill, right? Well, sometimes he needs to get his nap on. He needs to slay a good nap, just like he needs <laughs> to slay a good demon. Go pinch off a redeemer every so often? <laughs> That's what you gotta do. I will say that the asymmetrical multiplayer looks interesting, but I'm concerned about Walker Chain's actions at the wall soon, you know? Uh, for those who haven't seen it... Uh, instead of the deathmatch that they or the traditional modes that they had in the first Doom, they're basically taking Evolve and making it good and doing an asymmetrical um, multiplayer where it's a bunch of uh, slayers versus a player controlled demon, but instead of having it where it's a you know. Essentially, a game of hide and go seek. It seems to be a lot more active, which I would say was the main downfall of Evolve was just that it was so slow paced that you know it encouraged players to go play hide and go seek and a lot of cha uh, chasing. So yeah, I don't think the Evolve model was bad uh, in the slightest. Or, I should say, the idea. How they handled it, on the other hand. Now, that was bad. So, yeah. I, I'm just concerned about Doom Eternal because, hey, it's Bethesda, right? And Bethesda will Bethesda. Yeah. Duh. Their track record is shitty of late. I, I would I, I would say... Recent years. I, I would say their track record has always been shitty. It's just people are not kidding themselves anymore about how shitty their track record is. Think that's fair? Yeah, I think so. Although you, particularly like with your branch off with Skyrim, I think might I don't know. It's hard to say for sure. But, I, mean, I, it, I, it, I wouldn't even say issues. Skyrim is the branching off point. I would say that Skyrim is the point where I'm, uh, I was noticing just how shitty it was. I mean, even going back to Oblivion. It wasn't that good, and it wasn't nearly what they promised. Yeah. And that's a lot further back than Skyrim. Very true. 2006 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I would say Bethesda around Oblivion started uh, yeah, getting a lot shittier and relying a lot more on the multiplayer community. And, or, or should, not, I shouldn't say the multiplayer, the mod community. Because, yeah, Oblivion didn't have uh, multiplayer. Oh, I just had a thought. Negatory. Elder Scrolls, what? only its Fallout 76 Elder Scrolls. Because that's the, no, that, that's the other game that everybody's always wanting co op in. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'll pass it. <laughs> um, how many more do you have left in your queue? Uh, Doom Eternal was my last one. That's that's why I started okay. laughing so hard was that it was quite literally the end. Gotcha. Well, that's both of our queues then. We got two, three, four, five, six. Not terrible for me. And you got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So I had so a fifty percent average. Par for both of us. <laughs> yeah, All I right. was batting five hundred. Which in the major leagues that's pretty good. No idea about cricket though. Yeah, me neither. Well, I'm trying to try to turn into a joke or a pun or something, but it's not coming. So hey, Rage, hit him with the. Well, since when did that stop you? Yeah, I know. Oh, well, I've been Caffeine Rage. You can find me on the YouTubes, Gaming with Caffeine Rage. You can find me on Twitter, Gaming with CR. And maybe someday I'll get back around to Twitch, twitch.tv slash caffeine underscore rage. And you've been... 
Gaming Psychologist. If you want to find my stuff on the YouTubes, you can do so by searching for Gaming Psychologist. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do so at JMA4707. And you can be friends with me on Steam by sending your friend request to JArthur4707. And I skipped myself as well. Uh, you can find me on Steam, Caffeine Rage, of course. I knew I was forgetting something, and but something I haven't forgotten is the password, and the password for this week is Mom Tom. If you wish to let us know nice. exactly what episode of the podcast you're coming from, Mom Tom. Uh, just because we were talking about it before, <laughs> and it seemed too perfect, right? Yeah. And if you wish to send us something perfect, you could do so. VGL podcast at gmail.com with your letters, voicemails, game related topics, or you could tweet them to us, VGL podcast on the Twitter. Our lovely, lovely patrons have made this absolute madness possible. You find out more at patreon.com slash VGL podcast. And something our patrons have made possible is our Podbean uh, feed. You find us VGL podcast.podbean.com, which hosts the RSS feed. Show notes, links to all our stuff online, or you can find the show feed on iTunes, Google Play, or your podcatcher of choice. Our intro and outro music is on the ground, and our Discovery Q music is doobly doo. Both pieces are by Kevin McLeod. You can find his work at incomputech.com and... As always, as his lovely music starts to roll across my voice. Bye-bye now. See you next time.